Subaru's mid-sized XV crossover model looks a considerably better prospect in second generation guys. It makes even better use of its capable symmetrical permanent four-wheel drive system to turn in an even stronger performance off-road, and more importantly, also delivers a far better showing on it, thanks to the more sophisticated chassis you get this time round. There's also a smarter interior, improved media connectivity, and now class-leading standards of camera-driven safety kit. The XV has, in short, been rejuvenated. Want an SUV crossover? Well, lots of people do, it seems. If you, the car in question, needs to be family-sized, you'll probably find yourself looking in the Qashqai Class C segment, where there's lots of choice. Nearly all the options offer essentially delivering a family hatchback with SUV attitude, and ultimately, not much else. What if, though, a car of this kind could offer a little substance as well as a lot of style? What if it could actually walk the walk off-road as well as talk the talk on it? That'd be quite something. That would be almost unique. And that is exactly what Subaru's much improved second generation XV, this car claims to be designed to deliver. Now, if you happen to be familiar with the original version of this model, then the styling here might suggest that a subtle evolution has taken place, but don't be fooled. In fact, this Mark II design is pretty much new from the ground up. The grounding point in question being a stiffer, more sophisticated global platform that Subaru has apparently spent over a billion dollars developing for all the mid-sized models we're likely to see from this brand in the near future, including the fifth generation Impreza family hatch that shares most of this XV's engineering. These underpinnings have allowed the development team behind this car to deliver far higher standards in terms of on-tarmac ride, refinement and handling, all areas in which the original version of this car struggled. That earlier model was let down by its rather plasticky cabin too, so that's also been hugely upgraded and embellished with a state-of-the-art infotainment system. And Subaru is now claiming Volvo-style standards of safety, thanks to this car's included EyeSight package of camera-driven safety systems. In addition, the engines are very much changed, both of them petrol-powered and as standard, mated to the company's smooth Lineatronic automatic transmission. They're still of Subaru's unique boxer configuration though, that hasn't changed, and nor has this model's solid built-to-last feel or the fact that its off-road capability is on a different level from most of its soft-roading rivals. Which is what you'd expect from a manufacturer with expertise in SUVs dating back to 1995, and a company that today sees 87% of its European sales accounted for by cars of this kind. In fact, Subaru sells roughly twice as many four-wheel drive vehicles as Jaguar Land Rover worldwide. This one embellished with the brand's latest X-Mode and hill descent control systems. It's the sort of car that will have you praying for snow in the forecast but is it one that would be as easy to live with as its less capable competitors? Time to find out. Mainstream SUV crossover models as a breed are usually all about what they say. Uh, the raised driving position, the plastic body cladding, the big wheels, and not a lot else. Subaru, as a brand, doesn't hold with that. Here's a company that cares about what its cars can actually do, as well as the school-run statement they make, with the result that this XV has far more off-road ability than most bars will expect. This second-generation model does, in short, offer a different approach to their Qashqai and Cougar norm in this segment, but at the first glance, not a very different recipe from what was served up before. Same flat four boxer engine, same CVT auto gearbox, same symmetrical four-wheel drive system. Bear with us though, because uh, radical changes really have been made here, which is just as well because radical changes were needed. The first generation version of this car had just enough extra off-road ability to spoil its on-road driving dynamics, but not enough to tackle the kinds of tougher trails that were open to larger Subaru models, which meant that a lot of potential buyers understandably dismissed it as a convection that was really neither one thing nor the other. 
Now those people really ought to give this second generation XV another chance because its performance both on and off a paved surface has the potential to be considerably different. Uh, for off-piste driving you now get the X-Mode setup that the brand previously developed for its more expensive SUVs and that's there to optimise the tractional delivery of the symmetrical four-wheel drive system and work with the built-in hill descent control and we'll get to that in a bit after we've covered the more important changes made to this car's on tarmac handling. Now these come courtesy of the very different chassis this model now sits on, the so-called Subaru Global Platform. Uh, compared with the underpinnings used before, it's 70% more rigid, it allows for an even lower centre of gravity, and it can reduce body roll by up to 50%. As so many other brands have found, when you get this starting point right, it's very much win-win from there on in. Uh, take that issue of body roll, which is a significant one uh, with a car like this that features such a relatively high ride height. With a stiffer platform, you can use stronger suspension mounts and dial out a lot of the usual pitching about through the bends without the need for springing that's so firm that the driver will feel every bump in the road. In this case that's additionally helped by a rear stabiliser attached directly to the body and that further eradicates excess movement. A stronger chassis structure also means less creaking and better refinement and it's obviously much safer. And the reduction in the vehicle framework's lateral bending, in this case an astonishing 90%, means the car will perform better at different angles off-road. So, does it all make a real difference? Well, absolutely yes. Turn quickly into a tight bend and the raised driving position uh, can still make the car feel a bit precarious, but stick with it and you'll find plenty of grip and a body that's now admirably resistant to the kind of lurching forces that in the older model would have seen rear seat occupants cursing your ham-fistedness. It further helps that the XV's previously rather vague steering system has been retuned and reweighted so you can better feel what the front wheels are doing via a setup that now responds far more quickly to minute corrections. Of course, lighter and more agile, primarily front driven class rivals, uh, so cars like say it's Attica and Nissan's Qashqai, will always have the edge over this Subaru in terms of tarmac drive dynamics. What is important now though is that the XV gets much closer to that standard, which is quite an achievement given that in comparison to its competitors this is a heavier, higher riding, permanently four-wheel driven car. Will that kind of package be rather out of its comfort zone in the sort of urban jungle environment where owners will be likely to be spending most of their time? Well, not to the same extent as before. Ride quality, although it is certainly much better than it was previously, remains firmer than we'd really like, and you really feel that on the kind of poorer paved services that you get in town. But overall, this XV has a much more comfortable city demeanor this time around, and that's thanks to efforts that Subaru has put in to improve things like driver assistance technology and overall refinement. It also helps that the all-round visibility that you get from the properly raised driving position is now a little better, certainly out of the front anyway, where your view is aided by these slim windscreen pillars. The rear three-quarter view, though, uh, will have many ruining the lack of parking sensors and relying on the standard rear parking camera when they're nudging into a tight bay. You'll be wanting to know about engines, which, as we said earlier, are the usual units that Subro specializes in. Uh, flat four boxer power plants, uh, normally identifiable by their deep gravelly thrum. Now, some elements of that aural signature have been dialed out a bit this time around, uh, which will please those who prioritize refinement, but slightly disappoint others, including ourselves, who felt that the previous distinctive aural signature were one of the things that really made a Subaru a Subaru. Now, we should make the point that the XV no longer offers a diesel option, and that does seem odd considering the most versions of the previous model were sold in black pump fuel guys. Instead, buyers are being offered two heavily reworked versions of a couple of FB series petrol engines that the company's had in its portfolio for some time. Uh, there's an entry level 1.6 and the 2 litre unit that we're trying here. Both are offered only mated to Subaru's usual Lineatronic auto transmission, uh, the only belt driven CVT auto gearbox developed for use in an all wheel drive car. That's not been changed, so it still offers uh, seven simulated gear ratios that 2 litre buyers get to flip between 
using these steering wheel mounted paddle shifters. The engines though very much have been changed with 70% or more of their parts being completely new. In both cases there are higher compression ratios and much lower levels of internal friction, hence the lower noise levels we alluded to before. They don't offer any real extra performance though, which the base 114 PS 1.6 hitter model really needs. Its modest 150 Nm torque output necessitating plenty of shunting around between the virtual ratios if rapid performance is called for. Uh, to no great effect, 62 miles an hour from rest occupies a leisurely 13.9 seconds en route to 109 miles an hour, which is why almost all XV buyers plump for the 156 PS 2 litre variant that we're trying here. Now, although the torque improvement to 196 Nm is pretty small, the performance on offer will be far more acceptable to most likely buyers. Uh, the acceleration sprint time is enhanced to 10.4 seconds and top speed raised to 120 miles an hour. Even here, the petrol CVT auto combination isn't on paper one ideally suited to the creation of the kind of capable tow car that some potential buyers might be looking for. And that is the way it turns out. No XV can lug along more than 40 1400 kilos. Still, if that's sufficient, uh, you'll certainly find this Subaru a far more capable piece of kit than obvious rivals. That's thanks primarily to its symmetrical four wheel drive system. We ought to say a bit about that because this setup remains one of the primary selling points of this car with tractional advantages over rivals that really begin to shine through in wet or wintry conditions. Now some mid-sized SUVs of this sort can't be ordered with four-wheel drive at all and those makers who do offer it usually charge exorbitantly for the privilege. Even when the model in question does have 4x4 capability, it'll almost certainly be one of those part-time systems where the car runs front or rear driven most of the time, uh, adding in all-wheel traction only after grip's been lost with road surface. Uh, with Subaru's symmetrical four-wheel drive system though, you have a simple, balanced, permanent distribution of power to all wheels at the same time, which can stop traction being lost in the first place. Torque is distributed with a 60-40 bias to the front and there's no user input needed, no buttons to press. Well, not to activate four-wheel drive anyway. Uh, there is a button that you can press to further enhance this effectiveness, uh, that for the new X-Mode system we referenced earlier. Now, X-Mode works as would a conductor in charge of an orchestra, bringing together all the XV's different engineering elements to work more harmoniously for more confident navigation across slippery surfaces. Now, in this case, uh, that means coordination of the symmetrical four-wheel drive system with the throttle response, uh, the transition transmission changes and this Subaru's various braking and stability orientated electronic systems. So for example, with X mode activated, the throttle won't open too quickly in a way that might encourage wheel spin and the transmission is always kept in the lowest possible gear to maximize pulling power. Plus, the coupling force of the all-wheel drive system is raised, uh, dividing power more evenly between the four wheels, so maximizing tire traction. Uh, now, that is something that's further aided by the addition of something called enhanced LSD control to the car's vehicle dynamics control system. Now that extra feature is able to apply subtle braking to wheels that may be slipping. Uh, X mode also includes a hill descent control package that works at under 20 miles an hour to ease the car down slippery slopes at a constant speed, managing the brakes and throttle for you with the CVT auto gearbox simultaneously locking its clutches to simulate a locking differential. It's a pretty impressive package that you really expect to shine in light off-road use. And sure enough, it does. That's aided by a substantial 221 millimeters of ground clearance, a full 38 mils more than you get in something like a Seat Attica, and 10 mils more even than a supposedly more rugged Land Rover Discovery Sport. Not that you'll be taking on the Rubicon Trail. Um, yes, you will be much better set to tackle the next snowy snap than you would be in a conventional lifestyle orientated soft roading ride but this XV suitability for really gnarly terrain will be somewhat restricted by the off-road stats which have rather more in common with the uh, Surbiton than the Serengeti. Uh, there's an approach angle of 18 degrees, a departure angle of 24 degrees and a breakover angle of uh, 21.9 degrees in this 2 litre model. Plus of course like all monocoque based mainstream crossovers this one lacks proper off-roading mechanicals like a low-range transfer box or lockable individual axle diffs. 
Still, unless you're somewhere that you really shouldn't have gone to in the first place with your XV, you won't need any of that stuff anyway. What's important is that whether the route you're taking is a muddy field track or a rainy highway, progress in this car will be more stable and more confident, whatever the weather conditions. Of course, if you're a typical crossover customer, then you might be wondering whether this kind of extra capability is <laughs> even really necessary. Well, perhaps the answer to that is that it's uh, like having a watch that's waterproof to 200 meters. I mean, you'll probably never need it, but it's, it's good to know it's there. Subaru must have received some very positive ownership feedback on the styling of the original version of this XV because it hasn't fundamentally changed the look of this second generation model very much at all. As before, the basic shape is a fairly faithful representation of the crossover norm, but it has a purposeful, chunky stance, a tough, robust demeanor, and some very interesting details. Take the sleeker headlamp, for example, which uh, now feature a C-shaped motif with full LED technology, and they blend more smoothly into the central badge bar of this serrated black hexagonal grille. Further down, there's a solid looking black protection bar rather than the sort of thing you get with competitors, which is usually a flimsy piece of silvered plastic masquerading as a skid plate. Uh, flanking this are L-shaped corner outlets incorporating round fog lamps. Even more effort's been made at the back where sleeker combination lights now jut into the tailgate panel for the first time. Uh, the roof spoiler and the side surrounds of the rear screen have been blacked out to emphasize a wider look. And the aerial has been upgraded to a shark fin antenna. As before, these lower black plastic corner panels attempt to create a rugged look and they flank this central body colored skid plate. From a profile perspective, the Mark II model's changes are more difficult to spot. Uh, that's until you start to look closely and you note the more steeply raked windscreen and the slightly lowered rear roof line. For us though, the thing that most notably sets this XV apart from the more usual family hatch-based mid-sized SUVs is a significantly raised stance with its 221 millimeters of ground clearance. That's considerably more than is offered by most rivals. It all encourages you to take the usual crossover cues a bit more seriously Seriously, uh, for example, the roof rails and the black plastic clad wheel arches that house rims that'll be either 17 or 18 inches in size, depending on your selection between the 1.6 or the 2 litre engine. Of course, what's more important is the stuff that you can't see, and in this case, that is very significant indeed. This second generation XV gets the billion dollar Subaru Global Platform that we first saw showcased by the company's fifth generation Impreza family hatch. as a chassis that's a massive improvement on the previous model's rather crude underpinnings. As a result, the body is now 70% more torsionally rigid, and it's 70% better at resisting lateral bending forces. The rear subframe is claimed to be 100% more rigid. Those are impressive figures, although they do rather make you wonder about the solidity of the previous model. Now that's all hugely important, and so are the changes that Subaru's made to this XV inside. Uh, let's be frank, the cabin of the previous version of this model felt well, pretty down market for such a relatively expensive crossover. Now, this interior might not uh, bring to mind premium brand standards of quality. Uh, some of the switchgear is still a bit cheap looking, but overall, it's a huge improvement. And that's especially if you've opted for this particular car's SE premium trim level, which includes supple leather upholstery with smart orange stitching, uh, trims the center stack, extends across the fascia, and adorns the doors. Even lesser variants look quite smart thanks to the copious use of soft touch plastic and nice touches like this uh, silver mid-level trimming strip which extends into carbon fiber panels around the door pills. Someone at Subaru has finally realized that the showroom interior experience a car can offer is just as vital to selling it as any engineering technology it might have. Perhaps the most important development though uh, lies with the changes that have been made to the center dash infotainment screen, which sits higher up the fascia than before. It's grown in size to eight inches. Uh, it has a far classier user interface and it now incorporates smartphone mirroring for Android Auto as well as Apple CarPlay. Uh, as you'd expect, this is the portal from which you access the six speaker DAB stereo system and the usual phone and media features, as well as the satellite navigation setup that you'll find fitted to plusher variants like this one. 
Uh, the screen offers a smartphone style swipe and pinch control function for map displays and it houses a standard fit rear view camera and that offers a super wide 160 degree field of view behind the car when you're reversing. Voice control is standard and owners will also be able to download a wide range of apps. Uh, a half for example which will enable you to stream music, uh, information, social media and other data services. Other manufacturers will also build the various vehicle informational functions you'll need into such a monitor, but uh, Subaru continues to prefer to separate these into an additional smaller colour screen at the top of the centre stack. Uh, from this now smarter display, you can oversee the various eyesight safety systems, plus there's a clock, a compass, a uh, trip computer readouts, and a useful off-road orientated screen that shows you the current body angle and the ongoing status of the symmetrical four-wheel drive system. Anything that both these uh, main monitors can't tell you will probably be covered off by the further screen which sits between these two clear instrument dials uh, that you view through this tactile three-spoke multifunction steering wheel. Now this covers off things like uh, fuel usage and tyre pressures plus it also includes a digital speedo. As before, there's enough uh, wheel and seat adjustment to make it easy to find a comfortable driving position on well-sculpted chairs that feature standard heated upholstery. And we continue to like the way that the heater controls are chunky and large enough to be used by a gloved hand. Uh, cabin stowage is reasonable. The door pockets do look a bit small, but they've been shaped to allow the placement of large bottles. Uh, the installation of an electronic handbrake switch below the gear stick uh, frees up space for a couple of horizontally orientated cup holders and there's a coin tray just behind those. Uh, there's this lidded box between the seats too and that's complete with a 12 volt socket and DC 5 volt USB ports. And there are more sockets, a uh, 12 volt USB and an aux in in this stowage area just ahead of the gear stick. Uh, there's no overhead compartment for your sunglasses but the glove box is big and there are also small trays in the door armrests. Accessibility to the back is helped by the doors that open wider than those fitted to many competitor models. Once inside, Subaru talks of room for three adults, but this uh, high centre transmission tunnel will make that difficult to achieve on all but the shortest journeys. Uh, be fine for three children though. If there are only two of you, then you'll be able to use the dual cup holders in this fold down armrest. Uh, the XV's comparatively long wheelbase gives a decent amount of rear legroom. Uh, the space available is helped by front seats that you can get your feet comfortably under. Headroom's fine too, uh, even in this sunroof equipped model. That's thanks to the fact that the lower ceiling necessary to incorporate that glass panel hasn't been extended into the back. Uh, it is a bit disappointing that the back of this centre stowage compartment couldn't have been sculpted so as to incorporate storage and a power point, and it does seem a bit mean to only offer a seat back pocket on the left hand side of the cabin. And out back, uh, well, we had hoped the fact that this Mark II model is 15 millimeters longer and 20 mils wider than its predecessor would have done something to improve levels of boot space that were previously rather cramped by class standards. Sadly not, uh, the 385 litre luggage capacity figure isn't much different to what it was before. With the exception of Ford's Cougar, most key competitors offer considerably more space than this. The small under boot floor compartment doesn't yield much extra room. Uh, this lower space is made possible by the fact that rather disappointingly for such a capable crossover, Subaru doesn't provide any sort of temporary spare wheel, just one of these uh, fiddly tire mobility kits. There's no 12 volt socket either, although you do get the usual bag hooks and tie down points. Now if you push forward these uh, 60, 40, split folding seat backs. The load area revealed isn't totally flat, but it is as spacious as most owners will need it to be, uh, 1,270 litres in size. Think of a typical family hatchback based C segment crossover model, uh, say a Nissan Qashqai, a Renault Kajar, or a Seat Attica. And then think how much more you'd be prepared to pay for it if it had more solid build quality, stronger standards of electronic safety, automatic transmission, and a properly capable four wheel drive system that's able to take you further than just a muddy car park. 
Now, if the figure that you now have in mind resides in the 25 to 30,000 pound bracket, then you'll be happy with the way that this Subaru XV has been priced because it is right in that ballpark. Yes, it is a chunk more than you might have expected to pay for an SUV of this size, but in return, you do get plenty to justify that. Not least a car that'll probably still be going strong after five or six years of hard use. The kind of point where competitors are beginning to fall apart. Let's talk you through the range, which has an unusual look to it. Most competitors in this segment concentrate on diesel power, uh, give you the odd auto gearbox option, and either don't offer four-wheel drive at all, or restrict its availability to hopelessly expensive flagship variants. In contrast, at the launch of this second-generation XV, buyers were offered a lineup that was entirely petrol-propelled, with every variant featuring Lineatronic automatic transmission and Subaru's famed symmetrical permanent four-wheel drive system. So, you're getting the idea, this model is a bit different. The options on offer start with a 1.6 litre engine developing 114 PS, but almost all buyers will probably choose to find £1,500 extra to get the 156 PS 2 litre model we're trying here. Either way, there's a choice of base SE trim or for 2000 more, the plusher leather lined SE premium spec we're trying today. Uh, now, various electrified hybrid options have also been designed to work off this car's global platform in the future, but you'll need to consult your dealer about those. Our focus here is on the mainstream conventional models. Now, before we look more specifically at how these stack up against similarly sized family hatchback based mainstream sellers in the SUV C segment, it's worth putting the pricing of this car into context from an overall Subaru range perspective. After all, the brand sells quite a few compact and mid sized four wheel drive vehicles. Uh, now, to start with, there's the all wheel drive Impreza family hatch that this XV is based on, which costs only slightly less, but of course, that car's not really designed for rough road use. For that, you'll need either the Subaru Forester, a marginally bigger SUV which competes with slightly larger, pricier C-segment models like the Toyota RAV4 or the Honda CR-V, or the Subaru Outback, an all-wheel drive estate that provides a more capable alternative to SUV-style station wagons like Volkswagen's Passat Alltrack. Now, most Outback models sell for getting on for £35,000, but the Forester is more comparably priced against an XV, uh, an equivalent two-litre automatic variant commanding a model model premium of around £1,500. Will typical customers pay the extra cash for the slightly bigger model just to get a bit more boot space? Well, probably not, which explains why this XV is expected to account for over a third of the company's global sales going forward. Its success, though, will be judged on how effective it can be in broadening Subaru's customer base and generating conquest sales from other brands competing in this class. Uh, so let's see how XV pricing pitches this model in comparison to other directly equivalent contenders in the class. Now, the sticker prices for SUVs in this segment start at just under £20,000, but that, of course, only gets you front-wheel drive and a pretty spartan level of spec. Someone buying this Subaru will be looking at a well-equipped four-wheel drive crossover of this kind, and for that, your starting point will usually be just over 25,000. So not very different from the kind of figures that this Japanese maker is asking here. Now we will be basing our comparisons around the two liter XV model we're testing here, since that's what most potential customers will be going for. A car with a starting sticker price that at launch was around 26,500 pounds. Look around at directly comparable rivals and you'll find that there aren't very many and that those options that do exist won't save you much. Uh, the least expensive petrol powered automatic four wheel drive versions of segment rivals like Skoda's Karok, uh, Kia Sportage, Hyundai's Tucson, and Suzuki's SX4 S-Cross will all save you no more than around a thousand pounds. A Mini Countryman Cooper All 4 Auto will cost about the same as this Subaru and the least expensive petrol-powered all-wheel drive auto versions of Ford's Cougar, uh, Honda CR-V and Jeep's Renegade will all need a budget about two thousand pounds higher. Now, if you're wondering about uh, segment favorites like Nissan's Qashqai and Renault's Kajar, well, they're not really relevant for comparison because the all-wheel drive variants in each case come only with diesel power and they can't be had with automatic transmission. Uh, for reference though, uh, the least expensive manual diesel four-wheel drive Kajar you can have costs about the same as a two-liter XV. Uh, the least expensive all-wheel drive Qashqai, meanwhile, costs about 2,000 pounds more. Still think the Subaru is expensive by class standards? 
Satika and Mazda CX-5 are two other class favorites that only come with diesel power and high price tags if you want them in 4x4 form, but at least you can have them with four-wheel drive mated to automatic transmission. That is, providing you can afford a sum that'll be in the 30 to 31,000 pound bracket. But let's get back to more relevant petrol-powered two-litre four-wheel drive automatic mid-sized SUVs that could be seen as XV alternatives. Beyond the models that are already mentioned, everything else you could look at in meeting that criteria in this segment is considerably more expensive. And by that, we mean an asking figure of around £32,000 upwards. Now, for this kind of money, you could get yourself appropriate versions of Volkswagen's T-Roc and Tiguan, uh, BMW's X1, Volvo XC40 and Audi's Q3, but that's about it. If you haven't mentioned the C-segment SUV that you have in mind, it's almost certainly because it can't be had with four-wheel drive, and so it isn't a credible XV alternative. Mind you, Subaru brand loyalists would probably argue that none of the crossovers that we just mentioned are proper alternatives to what you get here, given that they offer you significantly less ground clearance and they feature no kind of permanently operable four-wheel drive system. If having considered all of that, you conclude that it is an XV that you really want, then you're gonna to need to know just how generous Subaru has been with the standard spec. So let's take a look at that now. Uh, even on entry level SE variants, the kit list runs to full LED headlights with auto activation and high beam assist, roof rails, front fog lights, uh, heated power folding mirrors, UV protection glass, which is privacy tinted further back, rain sensitive wipers, wiper de-icers, headlight washers and a thatch category one alarm immobilizer. You get alloy wheels too, of course, 17 inch rims on 1.6 liter models and 18 inches on the two liter variants. Uh, inside there's dual zone air conditioning, a keyless access system with a push button starter, heated front seats and adaptive cruise control. Plus there's leather for the gear stick and the multifunction steering wheel. Also standard is the Subaru infotainment and audio system with its eight inch color touchscreen. That's the portal via which you access the six speaker DAB stereo system and use the Bluetooth phone functionality. This package includes Apple CarPlay and Android Auto smartphone mirroring, voice recognition, dual USB ports and an aux in jack. Uh, there's a rear view camera too and that's some compensation for the fact that front and rear parking sensors are notable by their absence. What is now standard though is the brand's X mode system for off-road use and that was previously limited to Subaru's more expensive models. This is able to seamlessly take control of the engine, the transmission, the brakes and the symmetrical four-wheel drive setup to help you navigate slippery surfaces or steep slopes. It also activates hill descent control which on muddy tracks will maintain a constant speed when the car's moving downhill. Uh, find the £2,000 premium Subaru requires for this car's premium SE trim, and of course, you get a lot more. Uh, the seats gain full leather upholstery and eight-way electrical adjustment. Uh, the Subaru infotainment system has SD card navigation and Siri eyes-free control, and there's a power sliding glass sunroof. Uh, whatever trim level you choose, though, bear in mind that unless you want your XV finished in this crystal white finish, you'll have to pay extra for one of the various pearl and metallic shades that the brand offers. And if you want to go further than that in personalizing your car, there are, of course, plenty of desirable options. Now, if you're a typical active XV buyer, then you want to know about the usual tow bars, roof racks, roof boxes, and roof carriers for skis and kayaks. Uh, there's also a bike carrier for the roof, or one that clips onto the back of the tailgate, and which can take an e-bike or two if needed. Plus, you can also specify steel or aluminum engine underguards for rough off-road work. For the inside, you can add special blue cabin illumination, bespoke door sill covers, and an extra center console tray. In the boot area, you can specify extra LED illumination and a luggage divider that separates the cargo area from the passenger compartment. An extra vertical net can subdivide the estate compartment and there are deep and shallow cargo trays. A rear seat back protector can guard against luggage or pet damage. And there's a neat boot flap that folds over the loading sill to protect against the dents and scratches that tend to happen when when you're lumping things in and out. Uh, alternatively, a cargo step panel in resin or stainless steel can be specified to cover that loading sill. 
If you want to personalize the look of your XV, there are various aesthetic embellishments you can add, front grille winglets in orange or black, and a lower side decoration for, for example. Uh, some of these options have a protective function, the foil covers for the door mirrors, uh, the roof, the uh, door handles, and the front and rear bumpers, for example. And resin underguards are available to protect the front, side, and rear of the car. Plus, the lower side sills can be further looked after by splash guards and a carbon side protector. On to safety, which is an area where big strides have been made with this second generation design. Now, a major failing with that old XV was that it hadn't been engineered to incorporate the latest camera driven safety kit that buyers increasingly now expect. This Mark II model emphatically puts that right, moving from the bottom to the top of the class in this regard, courtesy of Subaru's impressively complete package of EyeSight driver assist technology, all of which comes fitted as standard across the range. Now, the brand has now produced over over a million EyeSight equipped vehicles and a recent study by the Institute for Traffic Accident Research and Data Analysis in Japan found that Subaru models fitted with EyeSight were 61% less likely to have an accident than those without it. Look in detail at how the system works and it quickly becomes clear why that is. The setup uses two stereo cameras, one mounted either side of the rearview mirror to monitor the road for up to 110 meters ahead as you drive. These then are used to capture three dimensional color images that are nearly as sharp as those seen through the human eye, hence the system's name. Now that extra accuracy makes quite a difference. Other similar camera driven safety systems can only recognize upcoming hazards as vague unidentified obstacles. In contrast, uh, the EyeSight cameras can specifically recognize vehicles, motorbikes, bicycles, pedestrians, and lane markings. As the car moves closer to the potential hazard, the EyeSight setup takes an image from each camera and compares those images to determine your closing distance to the object. Software decisions can then be made in the blink of an eye to either warn you to take avoiding action or to autonomously apply braking so that an accident can either be completely avoided or its severity significantly reduced. So that is basically how the EyeSight autonomous braking setup works. Subaru calls this pre-collision braking, but five other systems are also provided as standard on this car using that EyeSight technology. And let's run you through them. Uh, at highway cruising speeds, adaptive cruise control automatically regulates your distance to the vehicle in front. Um, lane keep assist will apply gentle steering correction if at over 40 miles an hour, you're about to deviate over the road lane markings. Lane sway and depart your warning will give you visual and audible warnings of if the car gets caught by a gust of wind or departs its lane without indicating. A lead vehicle start alert will prompt you if you're stopped in a traffic queue and you haven't noticed that the vehicle in front has started to move. And pre-collision throttle management will warn you if you select drive instead of reverse when the car is facing an obstacle, say if it's parked facing a wall for example, and it'll cut the engine to prevent an impact. And there's more. All XV variants also get Subaru's rear vehicle detection system package, which includes three more key features. Blind spot monitoring works if on the move you're about to pull out in front of another vehicle. Lane change assist works on the highway to warn you if another vehicle is approaching the rear of the car in the neighboring lane. And rear cross traffic alert warns you of approaching traffic when you're reversing out of a parking space. It's all very reassuring. We should also make the point that this second generation XV is also a fundamentally stronger and safer car than it was before. Body strength's been increased by 40%, allowing the chassis to absorb more energy in the event of a collision and disperse it more widely beneath the seating compartment. In addition, all XVs now get steering responsive LED headlights that turn with the bends and which dip themselves at night in the face of oncoming traffic. Now the result of all this has been a string of safety awards for this XV around the world and as expected, it's gained a full five-star rating by independent assessors Euro NCAP. Plus, of course, the previous model's full suite of more traditional safety features has been carried over. Uh, a little disappointingly, European spec models don't get the pedestrian protection airbag, which is standard on XV sold in Japan, uh, but you do, of course, get the usual front, side, and curtain airbags, plus a driver's knee bag. And you'll find the usual electronic aids for traction and stability control to hopefully ensure that you never have to use them. Uh, there's a brake assist feature built into the force sensor, four-channel 
ABS system to maximize deceleration in emergency stops. And hill start assist is also included to stop you from drifting backwards on uphill junctions. A safety pedal setup uh, prevents foot injuries in crashes, and there are also anti-whiplash head restraints and ice fix child seat fastenings. In short, it all adds up to a very complete safety showing that most rivals in this class can't get close to matching. You might expect this XV to struggle against obvious alternative SUVs when it comes to cost of ownership returns. After all, the key reason that rivals don't themselves feature this car's always-on permanent four-wheel drive system is to keep fuel and CO2 readings in check. Uh, that's why most so-called all-wheel drive competitors actually run drive systems that keep them front-driven most of the time. Uh, there are also other reasons why the Subaru brand hasn't generally been the one that your company accountant would ideally recommend. Um, most of this manufacturer's previous models have tended to be on the heavy side and virtually all of them have featured boxer engines with a reputation of being, well, a little bit fond of the drink. This kind of perspective isn't helped by lazy journalists who uh, don't compare like with like and unfavorably compare the returns of the all-wheel drive petrol-powered automatic XV with those of two-wheel drive manual gearbox diesel-powered rivals. In analyzing previous versions of this car, we've always tried to compare apples with apples. And when we've done so, we actually found that the figures returned weren't really very far away from those produced by all-wheel drive rivals with similarly sized engines. Factors such as um, a relatively like body shell, slippery aerodynamics, and an efficient CVT auto gearbox all help the Japanese brand's cause, as does an auto start-stop function that cuts the engine when you don't need it, or when you're stuck in traffic or waiting at the lights. This kind of real-world showing ought to be usefully enhanced by this second-generation model, thanks primarily to a lot of work that Subaru's engineers have done on the two petrol boxer power plants. Now, these are both lighter by up to 14 kilos, and they feature a higher compression ratio and lower levels of internal friction. Uh, the two-litre unit that we're trying here also gets tweaks which increase airflow into the cylinder, so achieving a better mixture and improved fuel efficiency. Uh, but enough with the background detail. Well, let's get to the figures. Uh, the 1.6 Lineatronic model manages 44.1 mpg on the combined cycle and 145 grams per kilometer of CO2. For this 2 litre variant, uh, the readings are 40.9 mpg and 155 grams per kilometer. We would understand if you didn't find those figures to be especially eye-catching, but you do have to put them into perspective against the readings that you would get from other four-wheel drive, petrol-powered, automatic mid-sized SUVs in the segment. And once you do that, sure enough, once again, this Subaru showing doesn't look at all bad. Okay, so this two-litre XV variant can't match the kind of returns that you'll get from rivals with downsized 1.4 or 1.5-litre engines, base all-wheel drive auto versions of the Mini Countryman, uh, the Skoda Karok, and the Suzuki SX4 S-Cross, for example. But it's right on a par with, say, all-wheel drive petrol-powered auto versions of the Jeep Renegade or the Volkswagen T-Roc. And the figures you get with this Subaru are considerably better than those you'd manage if you owned, uh, say, an all-wheel drive automatic automatic petrol-powered Ford Cougar, Honda CRV, uh, Toyota RAV4, Kia Sportage, or Hyundai Tucson. In other words, it's time to lay the legend of the fearsomely thirsty Subaru to rest at last. A decently sized 63 litre fuel tank gives all models a useful touring range too. Uh, what else? Well, residual values are on a par with mainstream models in this class. Expect a 36% retained value after three years and 60,000 miles. And insurance groups are competitive, uh, providing you rate them against comparably powerful four-wheel drive diesel rivals. Uh, you're looking at Group 10E for the 1.6 litre petrol model and Group 16E for this two litre version. Servicing intervals are every 12,000 miles or every year, whichever comes around first. And there is also the peace of mind of a five-year, 100,000-mile warranty, which embarrasses the three-year, 60,000-mile package that most rivals offer. You also get a three-year recovery and roadside assistance package that you'll almost certainly never need.
The SUV crossover genre is one that Subaru ought to excel at. The main ingredients are, after all, already in place, fundamentally in terms of product expertise. The company can draw on a long tradition of rugged, multi-purpose all-wheel drive cars. In fact, it's sold 15 million of them, more than any other manufacturer. The issue, though, in this segment is all about packaging and presenting this clever engineering in a way that's accessible and appealing to mainstream customers. This second-generation XV makes a much better job of doing that. It is, says Subaru, a car that's better where it matters. Whether you agree will of course depend on what matters to you. If you don't really need four-wheel drive, decent ground clearance and belt and braces levels of camera-driven safety provision then move right along. Plenty of cheaper, flimsier, family-sized Qashqai class soft roaders are available from all the main volume brands. These cars will probably be slightly cheaper to run because they don't have the same level of overall capability. And for the same reason, most will be slightly more engaging to drive on tarmac too. Although Subaru has undeniably narrowed the gap in this regard, thanks to this Mark II XV model's much stiffer and more sophisticated global platform. Plenty of other things that might have put you off the previous generation version of this car have also been sorted. So media connectivity is now properly up to scratch and the cabin at last feels of reasonable quality. Of course, this Subaru still isn't perfect. Uh, you might well be disappointed by the lack of engine and transmission choice. Ride and refinement could be better and the boot really ought to be bigger. These things needn't be deal breakers though. And for many loyal buyers, they certainly won't dilute the XV's many virtues. In summary, what we continue to have here is a refreshing change from the whole style over substance approach that seems to characterize so many SUV crossover models. That's something that Subaru has never quite understood and hopefully never will. <laughs>